or maybe your list might include more things that are of a different nature, more intangibles like love and joy and peace and happiness. But it doesn't matter what it is that you ask for. All of us have one motivation behind what answer we give to that question because we want what we believe in that moment will give us the most satisfaction in our life. If, if I just had that one thing, my life would be so much better. If I just had that, that would be so great. So what would you like for Christmas? Or maybe I could actually reframe that question and say, what would you like from Christ this Christmas? What would you like from Jesus? And perhaps you actually never considered that question, given the, just kind of the stressful environments that we all live in, keeping up with day to day. Where do you find the time to think about other things? But then if, uh, really, what's Christmas if we don't think about the person whose name is in front of that season, Christ? After all, isn't he what Christmas is all about? And you'd go, yeah, yeah, of course Christmas is about Christ. I, I always, I always, Pastor, I always keep him forefront in my celebrations. And besides, I, I know what I want from him. In fact, you talked about it last week, and you talked about Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, and I've received him as my Savior. That's the reason he came to earth. And that sounds like the right answer, doesn't it? But I want to remind you that the British ambassador also gave the right answer. It wasn't a wrong answer to, to the question. He just didn't understand the deeper implications of that question, realizing that it ran further down into the sinking of his heart and what he really wanted. And what the Christ child came to do also runs much deeper, much deeper than just what we usually contemplate. Oh, for sure, Christ came to be the world's savior, but he also came to be the world's sanctifier. And I would suggest to you that there is a huge difference, a world of difference between being saved and being sanctified. You see, accepting Jesus Christ is the first step. It's the entry step into the kingdom of God. But we must also accept him as our sanctifier if we desire to experience the richness and the depth of his love and his life in him. John said, uh, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Not just a little bit, all of it. And so, just as we did last Sunday when we considered Jesus Christ, our Savior, we asked a number of questions. And we're going to do the same, and the same questions, just with a different descriptor. Why on earth do I need a sanctifier, especially for Christmas? So if you have your Bibles, you can open them or your app on your phone uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. John chapter 17. And here in this chapter, it is probably the, the most famous prayer of Jesus. We often think that the Lord's Prayer is famous. Uh, we all, well, I shouldn't say we all, but most of us know it um, by heart. And there's still some of us here who went to public school. We actually had to learn it. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore. But in John chapter 17, we actually have what I think is the most significant prayer of Jesus. And this is a prayer that he is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours away from his death. It was the night in which he was betrayed. He utters this prayer. Now, he had told his disciples a little bit earlier that he was going to be taken away from them pretty soon. His time of his death was approaching. And so Jesus sensed an urgency in the moment as he uttered this prayer to his father. And as we read the prayer, I think we find it kind of interesting to note that it doesn't focus on Jesus uh, in his fear and anxiety, uh, trying to escape what is coming to him the next day. Rather, Jesus is focused on his disciples, and he is asking his father for the well-being of those who choose to follow him. And so... We can't look at the whole prayer this morning, but I want to take just a segment of that prayer, uh, beginning in verse 15, to hear what Jesus has to say. And so he says it this way. 
My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Now, here in these verses, Jesus uses the word sanctify three times. Sanctify, 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 knowing that his time is up. And so he's asking his father to sanctify his people, his followers. So it might actually be a good question for us this morning to first consider this. What on earth is sanctification? What does that word mean? It's it's not a word that we use in everyday conversation, at least not people that I hang around with. Um, So it's probably wise to try to understand what it means. So sanctification is actually the English word. It's translated from the Greek. Not that you care about this. The Greek word is hagmos, hagiasmos, rather, which is rendered. So here's the meaning of that word. The word sanctification or hagiasmos means holiness, consecration, or elevation. So there is a guy, none of you know him, he's long dead, George Partington, who was an early theologian, noted theologian, in the early movement of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And he said the word sanctification has three meanings, separation from sin, dedication to God, and appointment to ministry or, or set apart for service, set apart for the service of God. So separation from sin, dedication to God, and appointment for ministry. So we need to understand, on one hand, there's, there's two, two things going on, right? On one hand, sanctification, holiness, is a stated condition of everyone who puts their trust and faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Everyone, by God, is declared holy. Every one of you. Over your head, or on your head, God has marked the word holiness. You are holy. You are sanctified. You are set apart. You are clean. You are pure before God. Now, that act of God is what we would call a judicial act. You know what judges do, right? So a judge sits on his little throne, and he makes a declaration. He makes a judicial comment, and he, makes, he either says to the person, uh, you're guilty and going to jail, um, or uh, you're free. And of course, God said, as we stood before him in our sin, he goes you're free. And the reason I'm freeing you from the penalty of your sin is because Jesus has paid the penalty. Jesus has paid the cost. He has redeemed you. He has set you free. You are now uh, free to go. You are declared uh, not only saved, but he says you are also sanctified. And so we look at the Apostle Paul, who writes, I think, all, all of his letters, or at least most of his letters, with the introduction to the saints, to the holy ones, right? Who's emphasizing this already aspect of a person's stated judicial standing before God as holy. So positionally, we are declared holy. But in reality, it doesn't feel like that, does it? You go, uh, life sucks. Uh, life is hard. Oh, dear me, here I am sinning again, doing things I know I'm not supposed to be doing. And so we don't feel, if I was to ask you, I won't ask you, but if I was to raise your hand, but if I was to ask you, here to, here, who here today feels really holy? I rather doubt that many of you would put up your hand. I, yeah, I feel really holy. We don't usually feel that way because not only sanctification's got this, these two parts. So we have this declaration, you are holy, but experientially we don't feel very holy because 
Sanctification is a process of moving us towards that nameplate of being declared holy. So we know that we're sanctified positionally, but experientially, experientially, we're not quite there yet. So it's a present reality, yet there is a further work of holiness that God is wanting to accomplish in our heart. There is a deeper work of the Holy Spirit that still yet, still yet needs to be carried out. So it is both a work that is performed in the life of the believer by God and God alone, but it is also a work of the individual believer to be involved in the process of becoming holy. You see, in other words, it's a part that you must play in the unfolding drama of who God has called you to be and has set the path on, the path of your life on, because in your holiness, he has consecrated you, he has set you apart for ministry, he has set you apart for service, he has set you apart to accomplish the things of God. And so I have to participate in that process. Becoming sanctified is not a passive engagement. I've got to be in it. So numerous commands, oh, we read them, don't we? And we kind of shudder. There are numerous commands in the Bible that imply this responsibility of the individual believer to be holy. So in in Leviticus, we are called be holy. And then Peter picks that up later and he quotes from that and he says, be holy. And then Matthew comes along and he says, be perfect. (laughs) And then Paul says in Romans, give your bodies over as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And so at the moment we receive Christ as Savior, we entered into uh, the process of sanctification or that of becoming holy. Because you see, the aim of reconciliation with God is not simply your salvation, but your holiness as well. Christ carried out his work of reconciliation, we sang about it, to present us to God as consecrated, unblemished, and holy before God. Christ came not only to save us from the power of sin, that he did, but he also came to deal with the effects of sin in our life as well. He came to make us holy. So, does that mean that once I'm sanctified that I'll never struggle with the power of sin again? Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. We all struggle with the power of sin because it's set before us every day. Sanctification is a lifelong process, and in that process, we have these ups and downs and these bumps and bruises along this way. Because none of us, I rather doubt, will ever be completely sanctified or made completely holy this side of heaven. But there is a direct correlation between sanctification and our ability to overcome temptation. And we know that temptation temptation presents itself, and when temptation presents itself, we always have a choice. Yes, I'll slide into it, or no, I'll reject it. We always have a choice. So listen to the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 15. He says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That's Jesus' prayer for you. And then after that, he said, Sanctify them. (laughs) Sanctify them. You see, our ability to stand up against the attacks of the devil, our ability uh, to deal with the ensnaring sin that is presented before us every day is affected by our relationship to the work of sanctification. I should have actually put this on a PowerPoint, but I want you to get something here this morning. While holiness, sanctification does not make it impossible for us to sin, the experience of sanctification does make it possible for us to not sin. Let me say that again. While holiness does not make it impossible for us to sin, the experience of holiness makes it possible not to sin. So, 
you say, Pastor, how important is sanctification? I mean, really? Um, isn't it good enough if I just ask Christ to be my Savior? Do I really need him to be my sanctifier as well? What difference does it make anyways? I'm still going to heaven, right? Right. You are. You see, the Bible makes it clear that it is by grace that you're saved through faith. Paul, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. We do not need to receive um, Christ as our sanctifier in order to, to, to obtain eternal life. You see, that gift of receiving Jesus was a gift that is received, the action, right? Our action is faith, by, and so by faith we receive Christ. So then, Pastor, does that mean that the work of sanctification is secondary? Well, let me say unapologetically and unequivocally, without apology, that it is not a second work of grace, it is a necessary work of grace that is all part of the same death of Jesus Christ that we have just partaken in here this morning. Jesus died to be your Savior, and he died to be your sanctifier. It's kind of a two-in-one deal, but there's still very distinct elements to how that works out. Because if you are to follow Christ into the deeper work of the Spirit of God that he wants to do in your life, it is only there that you will experience what he says in John 10.10 10, as the fullness of life. You see, it is possible to go through life as a follower of Jesus without accepting him as your sanctifier. It's possible. Many have done it. Many will do it. But I can tell you that if you do, it is a joyless, it is a powerless, and it is a degenerative form of Christianity. It is never what God meant for you. It's missing out on the greatest aspect of following Jesus Christ. A.B. Simpson, our founder, uh, said it this way. He said, in salvation, we pass, uh, or, uh, yeah, in salvation, regeneration, we pass out of death into life, but in sanctification, we pass out of the self-life into the Christ life. Amen. The Bible makes it clear that salvation is received by faith, absolutely, but it also stresses the importance of our sanctification. Salvational, yeah, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> I've mentioned in passing two other references on the importance of sanctification. So Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, he commanded his, he commanded his disciples, and he said this, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. Ooh. And then Peter quotes from the book of Leviticus, and he goes, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Okay. Ooh. I would like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to one more passage. And it is found in the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's right near the end of the book of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading at verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own body in sanctification and in honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no, no one of you should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Sanctification is not just a polite, uh, think about it, request of God. Uh, think about it, John. Do you want to be sanctified or not? It's a command. It's a command of God to be sanctified. Paul tells us that God 
that it's God's will that we should be holy and sanctified. And God has only one, get this, God has got only one desired end for you. And his desired end for you is holiness. That's why he died, to make you holy, just like your Father in heaven is holy. His one aim is the production of saints. That's why he came. He didn't come to save people out of self-pity, and he's not standing up in heaven as some kind of an eternal blessing generator machine, blessing us all. To be holy is in your spiritual DNA. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your DNA, that declaration that God declared you, you are holy, that's one thing. Hallelujah, thank God for that. But then he says, you have to activate it. You've got to activate it. It's God's will, it's his eternal design that every follower of Jesus should be fully sanctified. That leads to a problem, doesn't it? Um, As a rule, as a rule, you can take this to the bank. If God commands us to do something, then he will always supply the resources or the means to meet that end. Always. God does not set us up by pronouncing a standard of living and a code of conduct and then not provide the means to accomplish it. He he loves us too much to go, I need you to be holy like I am holy, and then not provide the means for it to actually take place. It would be foolish on his part because who of us in our own strength can be sanctified? Who of us can become holy? Who of us can become perfect? So as we discovered last week, um, we cannot do it on our own. I can't do it. So God, in his grace and in his mercy, provided the solution, right, to our need. He, he allowed this little baby to be born in the world. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, we have this account of Mary's visit from the angel. So here she is, this frightened young girl, 14 or 16, who knows? She was pretty young. And he told this young virgin that she was going to be a mother and that she was going to be the mother of not just any ordinary baby Because every other child that had ever been born or would ever be born came into this world with sin. It's just how it is. But this child would be conceived of the Holy Spirit to be free from and went free from sin. And the angel, in his declaration to Mary, says, He is the Holy One, the Son of God, verse 35. He is the Holy One. You see, God's plan was to send a perfect man to show us the way of perfection. And through his life, he taught us that it is possible to live in a sinful world and to not be overcome by it. And as the Bible points out, Jesus was tempted, just like you and I, nothing that you have experienced, uh, Jesus, Jesus has experienced, whatever temptations, come, it all came, Jesus knew it. Jesus experienced it. Yet, the Bible says, although he was tempted in every way, as we are, yet he was without sin. And so living a holy and blameless life is not just some kind of pie-in-the-sky thinking, right? Or wishful thinking at best. It is a lifestyle that every follower of Jesus can experience because that's what God wants for you. God does not set you up, as I said earlier, to say, I need you to live up here, and knowing that we can just, we all fall short of the glory of God, remember? We just can't make it on our own. But this capacity to be holy is experienced by accepting Christ as our sanctifier. Because it's through his power, not our power, that we can be victorious over the sin, over the temptation, so that when it comes to making those choices every single day in our life, we can choose to be holy or not holy. Choice is yours. So, 
He provided a perfect man, but he also provided a perfect sacrifice. Ultimately, our sanctification is based on what we celebrated here this morning already. He was crucified so that you and I could be made holy. And we read in Ephesians 5 that Christ, in fact, loved this church so much that he gave himself up to make her holy. And the author of Hebrews refers to Jesus as the one who makes people holy. That's his work. That's what he's come to do. And so, how do we receive him as our sanctifier? If it's God's will that I be sanctified, how do I, how do, I do this thing? Well, A.B. Simpson, helpful little book called The Fourfold Gospel, um, states that there's four steps that we need to take in order for Christ to become our sanctifier. First of all, we have to do, as we did last week, discover that um, we need to recognize our need. We have to recognize a need. God must do an inner work in our heart to show us that we need more than just a declaration of holiness. We must actually feel the need for a power of God, for a power greater than ourselves, working in our lives to make us holy. We must be so dissatisfied with our lives as they are, because if we're not dissatisfied with the way things are in our life, then we're never going to seek holiness because we'll be quite content to live in the this, this sin-stained life that we have, even though we may be a follower of, well, we, we may be, I was going to say a follower of Jesus. Technically, I suppose that may be true, but if we're not following in what he's calling us to do, then we're not really following, are we? And so to follow him means we have to allow the Holy Spirit to come and do something. But how does he do it? So Jesus, again in the garden, as he's praying this prayer in John 17, he says, uh, he says, you need to spend some time somewhere. And where does he say we need to spend time? He says, you need to spend time in the word. And so Jesus said this. He said, sanctify them by the truth. Verse 17, for your word is truth. Friends, as we study his word, as we get into his word, we begin to realize he's got much bigger plans for us than to simply give us a fire insurance policy or a get-out-of-jail card free. It's, it's way more than that. He wants us to become what we were created to be. We were created to be a holy people made in the image of a holy God. And, and the word of God... The purpose of the Word of God is a mirror to our soul because it shows us that we've got a long way to go before we get to where our desired destination is because we soon discover in the self-revealing revelation of God's Word to our heart that as we spend time in His Word, we, something, there's something powerful and wonderful happens when we spend time in His Word. You know what it is? So the more time we spend in his word, the less room there is in our life to sin. It's pretty simple. So is the word of Christ dwelling in my heart richly? Am I allowing the word of God to saturate my decision-making processes? And so there's, not, there's probably, between now and when we leave in a few minutes, you are probably thinking about stuff you got to do and decisions you got to make. I, I know you're not always listening to me. I get that. Um, you've got other things going on in your brain. And, but you're going to be confronted with a thousand decisions by the end of this day. Guar uh, guaranteed. There's going to be a thousand decisions you've got to make. Some of them you'll make consciously and some of them will be subconscious. I get that. But... If we're saturated in his word and his word is living in us, wherever we step our foot to make a decision, the word of God is there to inform us about the choices that we need to make. Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. That's how, as we let the word of God in, we get to live a life of purity before him. And then what happens, as we're in the Word of God, we begin to get a hunger and a craving for something else. 
You know what that craving is? That craving is his kingdom and his righteousness. We're no longer concerned about the, the daily bread stuff because we know that the daily bread stuff will take care of itself as our heart is aligned to him because it's his word that brings that up for us. And so that only comes in the recognition of our need and the word of God is the pathway that shows us what that need is. Secondly, Simpson would suggest that we need to reject personal um, attempts at holiness and simply recognize Christ as our sanctifier. This means turning away from our own well-crafted schemes, our own little spiritual manipulations that we sometimes try to affect with God or with others, and we simply need to seek the favor of God and accept his plan that he has for our life because we have to see that we cannot be holy and pleasing in our own power, in our own strength. It just doesn't happen. So D.L. Moody, this is a pastor from Chicago, a number of, well, probably a century ago now. I was going to say a number of years ago. Um, it's a number of years ago. Um, he, was, he was preaching one Sunday in his church, and he was explaining the truth that we cannot bring spiritual change into our lives in our own strength. You cannot change on your own. You need a power from outside of yourself to do something that you cannot do. And so he had this illustration, and so he held up his, uh, uh, well, they probably didn't have this in the 1800s, but he held up a glass, and he said, how do, I, how do I get the, and it was empty, he said, how do I get the air out of this? And so uh, somebody piped up and said, uh, well, you can put a suction pump on it and, and suck the air out. And he goes, I would do that, but then I would also destroy my mug because it would implode. Um, because of the, the um, um, vacuum that it would create. And then there was other suggestions that people had, and then he said here, he said, he took a pitcher of water, and uh, he began to displace the air simply by pouring the water, and he said, look, the air is all gone. It's all gone. And then he went on to explain that victory for the child of God uh, doesn't come by working hard to eliminate sinful, addictive habits, but rather by allowing Christ to take full possession. Let him fill you. Because it's only through Christ that we can be sanctified, be made holy. And then next, we need to receive his holiness. It's what I call the great exchange. We, we move from recognizing what the right thing to do is and then actuating it and actually doing it. And we have to surrender Oh, oh, surrender. To surrender means I've got to give up all of the things I've tried to hang on to do, right? And all of us are affected by many things. All of us are affected by the cultures we grew up in. All of us are affected uh, by the families of origin that we engaged in. All of us have been affected by the choices that we've made to try to find peace and satisfaction in our lives. Um, and yet often without Christ. And so the act of surrender is when we literally hold, <laughs> raise our hands, not so much as an act of worship, which we can do, but of an act of submission and, and then this act of giving up and surrendering before God all that we are. Because we have to be open before he can take that picture and begin to fill it. But if we close the door and go, oh, no, you're not having any of me. I want to keep control over my own life. Thank you very much. I'll just use you as my fire insurance plan. And God will go, okay, yeah, you're in. Uh, but uh, you're not going to have a lot of joy and a lot of happiness, nor will you experience the, the power-filled life of a follower of Christ. And so to choose to live uh, a holy life, we have to also make choices, right? So we have to surrender, but we have to open up ourselves to let his spirit work in us, that deeper work. And so sanctification is a life of Christ-centered choices, right? Made evident by our obedience to God and his word as we exchange our choices based 
on what we understand from his word, speaking into our heart. And we exchange our life for his. It's no longer, Paul said it, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, right? Lord, I empty myself. I exchange it. I do what Brian Dirksen The songwriter said, I choose today to give my life to you. I choose today. We receive it. So this sanctification thing. We need to understand two things about sanctification. Sanctification is, first of all, a crisis experience. I don't mean an experience uh, of a crisis like getting hit by a car. Um, Although sometimes, who knows, it might feel like that. The act of surrender is actually both a crisis and a progressive experience. So let me explain. The word crisis actually denotes a decisive moment, a turning point. It's a decision that I make at a specific time in my life. It's a one-time decision. And we have to ask Christ in that place to rid us of our own plans and our wants and our ambitions. And we come, and, and Lord Jesus, come by your Spirit and fill me with yourself. I would just want more of Jesus, that's all. It's, it's a crisis, and we make a decision. But sanctification is also a progressive experience. When we ask Christ to be our sanctifier, we're not going to be immediately transformed and sanctified in the moment. And there are several reasons that I could cite, but let me just sum sum it up by saying that while our hearts may be completely surrendered to God and doing his will at that moment in time to the best of our knowledge, it's only to the best of our knowledge. Because if your experience has been anything like mine, then you have come to many crossroads in your walk with Jesus, right? Many crossroads. Um, and the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate some things in our life as we allow him in, and he begins to show us that we're still trying selfishly to hold on to some part of our life that we're not fully surrendered in. And so that's where the progressive aspect of sanctification comes in. Because as we are enabled to see other areas of our lives that we're trying to control, Uh, rather than submitting them to the reign of Christ, we need a fresh work of the Holy Spirit to take place. And that is exactly what was referred to by Paul in Ephesians 5. He said, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's interesting to be filled. Be filled. um, it's, It's a verb. And it carries the idea of it, of giving control over to God. It, again, this act of surrender. And if we understand, if you go into the word and the, the imperative process, it's, it's, a, it's a passive verb, it's an imperative verb, and it's a present verb all at the same time. So in English, what that denotes is a continual act. Be filled, continue being filled, being filled, being filled. It carries on, and it's brought on us from outside of ourselves. I cannot fill my own bucket. I cannot fill my own heart. Only one person can do that perfectly, and that is our Father in heaven who is perfect, and he pours his perfection. He pours his holiness into us. It's an outside engagement, and it's not an option that we can choose to obey or ignore. In practical terms, it involves this daily surrender. It involves us voluntarily giving ourselves over to the care of God to be filled by him every single day. And then sometimes three times a day, or who knows. Every time this, our heart, which is deceitfully wicked above all, the Bible tells us, uh, things happen. And again, as I said, sometimes we think we're in a fully surrendered mode in the moment we are, but then the Holy Spirit reveals something else. And that's how good he is. That's how he loves us so much because he wants to cleanse us fr- fr- from the outside in, but then from the inside out so that sin no longer has dominion over us. And then Simpson suggests that we need to remain in Christ. The final step, if we believe that Jesus and we've invited the sanctifier in 
and we're now being daily filled with him, we have to have faith that he has accepted our denial of self and that he has begun the work of making us holy. And so we stand on that. Paul says we are sanctified by faith in Christ. We are sanctified by faith in Christ. And we have to believe that he will continue to provide the means for us to engage in this walk of holy living. Simpson writes again in the book, The Fourfold Gospel, he said, His presence has come into your heart. It may be like a little trickling spring upon a mountain, but it will become great rivers of depth and power. That's what happens when we let God in and we let God control. He doesn't give us the the running rivers all at once uh, because it would overwhelm us for sure. If the Skeena River decided to flood right now, that would not be good. Um, God has seasons um, that he allows for these things to happen. So I began this morning by saying this. Uh, There was an ambassador who was asked what he would like for Christmas. What do you want this year? Well, I know this. I know exactly what it is that God wants to give you. I, I'm not a clairvoyant. I just understand his word. And his word is that he wants to give us the fullness of his provision for us. But the only way that it can be yours is that you have to take it and then you have to agree with him to follow the plan that he's laid out for you because it's his desire that we be holy. That's what we were created to be. And holiness can only be found as we receive Jesus as our sanctifier, as, as we make decisions in life that keep us free from sin, and it can only be found, too, in receiving Christ as our sanctifier. And so why not get what you really want for Christmas? A clean heart. Do you want a clean heart? I want a clean heart. I know that my life isn't perfect, even though he declares that I am. I'm thankful for that declaration, but I have to continue to engage and walk and make decisions that I can allow Christ to be Lord of my life. And then I'll make that decision again tomorrow and the day after and the day after. It's a daily choice. You may want to spend some time in prayer. It's a good thing. We're family here. We all know we're broken, right? We know that, right? We're all broken. None of us have got it all together. And God says, come. He says, come. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He's talking to us, right? (laughs) That's who he's talking to. And he knows his created. He knows the ones he loves. But he desires to give us something more. He desires to fill us. But in order for us to be filled, we have to surrender. If we don't surrender, um, God will knock on our heart door, but if we don't open it, uh, we can't expect God to do anything. Yet I think that's how most of us want to live our life. Well, Lord, just let me carry on doing my thing, but I just need you to be that perfect little Santa Claus from heaven that when I need something, you'll give it to me. And And he never does. And then we get disappointed. But that's because our expectation is displaced. Why? Because he wants to do the deeper work in your heart. Everything that God does as our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King is to get to your heart. It's a heart issue. We're all broken. Surrender. That's how we start to engage in the process of the Spirit-filled, of the Christ-centered life. And so if there's some of you that want to come after I pray, you're more than welcome. I'd love to pray with you. Um, or others would love to pray with you too. Um, It's a decision. Make a decision. Lord Jesus, here we are, your people, and uh, we need you. We cannot make it on our own. (laughs) 
we need you for our salvation. Thank you. If you have made that decision here, that you have that gift of God. But some of you need the second gift of God, and that is the gift of his sanctification. You need to ask. He's a good God. He doesn't give us things that we don't ask for. He says, ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And so he puts the onus on us <laughs> to make the decision. And so, Lord Jesus, some of us need to make a decision maybe for the first time to invite you in to be the sanctifier of our life, to set our hearts and to renew our hearts in a place that will allow your work of holiness to begin engaging in us. But you need us to cooperate with your plan. And if we're going to be sanctified, we need to be sanctified by your truth. And so help us to be people of the word that would allow the word to explore the depth of our own sinful hearts that even we cannot fully understand or embrace. But your spirit does. And your spirit is trying to work in us uh, to make us people who are holy and perfect and pure. And so, Father, some of us have made that decision, but some of us need, again, just to come back to you again and to ask as Paul would suggest, don't be drunk with wine. Don't try to do things in your own. Be filled with the Spirit. And so, Lord Jesus, um, continue the work that you've started in us, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And so...